All righty. Good afternoon, everybody, on this Friday. Um, my name is Andre Vanderhoof. I am a. It will work. It will work. But if I go client, it will work. Anyways, hi. I'm Andre Vanderhoof. I'm a faculty member in the department. Um, I'm tremendously excited to be the person to introduce Iftikhar shortly. Uh, but before I do so, welcome current students, welcome current faculty, also welcome prospective students. We're really, really glad that you're here. Hope that you're having a wonderful day. Um, you managed to avoid the rain, but everybody has told you how much rain we've had, so we're not going to talk about that. Um, but what I do want to say is a couple of things. So one is, um, this is an ongoing cloaking series, and um, we get speakers of um, you know, all sorts of places, also talking about all sorts of different topics. Um, the department is very broad, as you probably discovered by now, uh, anything from health informatics to games to software engineering to ACI and more. Um, and so speakers come from these different fields. Uh, we actually, for that purpose, also actually record them all. They're on our website, they're on YouTube, um, if you're interested in seeing what other speakers are like. Um, but for today, we want to welcome Iftigar Ahmed. Uh, who is one of our own faculty members. He is here in his fourth year, fifth year now, something like that. Oh, something like that. I remember being in the <laughs> chair's office that Melissa occupies now, and <laughs> Iftikhar being one of the um, fresh graduate PhD students coming by interviewing, um, and uh, he left us with a great impression. We made him an offer. He was wise enough to choose UCI. Join us. <laughs> And we've been having a fabulous time since. He's been an amazing colleague. Um, he's brought a lot of energy, a lot of new ideas to the department, and a lot of collaboration. So we're just very, very appreciative of him being who he is. And he's going to share some of what he does. Okay, not all. If the card's all yours. Thank you. Like that. Yeah, I'm glad. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. It was nice talking to you. Uh, thank you, Andre, for the generous introduction. So today I'm here. To, by the way, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. So today I'm here to talk about what I have been doing here for last almost five years. So today's talk is about broadening software quality assurance from improving machine learning models to making software accessible. So before I start talking about the details of the talk, let me quickly tell you something about myself. So I finished my undergrad back in Bangladesh, and then I worked in the industry for four years as a software developer for the team that developed the first ever mobile commerce solution back in Bangladesh. And I was one of the two developers who did it. And that's when I realized the pain of a developer, the tools, the each uh, pains that they have to go through, that I had to go through, that excited me about investigating what can I do to make developers life easier. As a result of that, started my PhD in Oregon State, graduated in 2018, and immediately afterwards started here at UCI. <clears throat> so my research has been always about software quality. And what is quality? If you go to Google and search, what does what is uh, the definition of software quality? You will see different kinds of aspects. For example, you will see maintainability, efficiency, usability, many, many other definitions related to quality. Now, we as software engineering researchers have done a lot of work in this area over the last five decades or so. We have come across a long way but we are far being from far from being perfect, right? Because still there are bugs. People are getting killed because of software bugs. Uh, those of you who remember the Uber killing a pedestrian in 2018 because of a software bug. And then of course, in terms of money, we lost $2.08 trillion in 2020, only in USA because of software quality issues. So again, the summary is we are far from being perfect. And that's what I am working towards to make software perfect, to improve the quality. Now, when including me, most of us think about quality, we think about bugs, what kind of bugs occur in software. And a lot of people have looked into factors that 
contribute towards these bugs, factors including technical factors. And I'm also one of them. I looked at technical factors like port coverage. How much does it contribute towards identifying and introducing bugs and even like to make it more effective that much? However, apart from everyone else, early on, I realized that software development is a socio-technical process, right? Because there is humans involved, at least till now, there is <clears throat> tool involved. So we need to treat it as a socio-technical process. And what are the socio-technical factors that contribute towards bugs? So I looked at March conflict as one example. So March conflict happens when multiple people work in parallel on a shared piece of code. And how does that lead to or associate to bugs? I looked into that. Of course, I looked into other factors such as code smells. Those of you who don't know what code smell is, it's an indicator of poor implementation choice or design decisions. This is not necessarily a bug that is immediate, but most likely will lead to a bug in the future. So I looked at it and how does it contribute towards bugs? I also looked at design discussions. So people discuss design and what are the things that they are discussing? What is the depth of discussion and how does that associate with bugs that are occurring in the future? So these are all the things that I looked at and obviously try to learn from this and then take it and apply it in building better defect prediction models. And also I looked at quality assurance approaches for example, coming up with automated testing techniques and also evaluating test quality. So these were all the things that I was doing as a part of my graduate studies. And then of course I decided to graduate or I graduated and came here at UCI. So now I'll talk about what I have been doing here for the last five years. So I have been focusing on quality assurance techniques uh, here which is my bread and butter. <laughs> so I have been working on that, which is my bread and butter, right? So coming up with additional or new testing approaches, identifying concepts like test smells, building tools. So I have been doing those, not code smells, test smells. We have been building those. However, while working on these, I noticed a couple of things that we are very much reliant on machine learning for all the works that we do, right? And how does that impact the quality of the produced software? How does it impact our research? So that led me to start looking into machine learning quality and its impact on quality. And the other thing, while working, I realized that the manifestation of bugs don't only impact in terms of bugs, but it also impacts the user. It makes the software not usable in terms of inclusion and accessibility, which happened because of being part of such broad uh, department. So I also looked into that in collaboration with my colleagues here. So one important thing to notice here is that the concept of quality is not divergent, it's converging, right? It's converging, everything is converging towards quality. And what I do is I learn from all these additional facets or dimensions and try to bring it in, in the quality assurance techniques that I develop so that I can make it even better. So that's what my research is all about. And in today's talk, I cannot talk about all of these papers that I have listed here. I'll be talking about the three that I have uh, highlighted. So let's start. The first one that I'll be talking about is Commit Message Matters, Investigating Impact and Evolution of Commit Message Quality. And this is a work with my PhD students, uh, PhD student GY, uh, which will be published, which is accepted at uh, ICSI and will be presenting it in May in Australia. So what did we look at? <clears throat> so we all know that, at least some of us know that the unit of change in modern software development is commit, right? And in a commit, we have essentially two parts. We have the commit message that explains what am I doing, why am I doing it? And we have the commit itself, the change itself, which could be the source code, could be other artifacts. Now commit message is very important because it kind of works as a form of documentation. 
not only for the developer who is working on right now, but also the developers who will be working in future, because it gives them the context, especially in the absence of the developer who wrote the code to begin with. So that's why quality of commit message is important. And here I just have an example of what commit message looks like. Now, for the longest, the definition of what makes a good quality commit message has not been clear. Most recently in 2022, there was a paper published in ICSI by Kian Appel, where they first defined what makes a good commit message. It should have the what information and why information. So what we did is we did some investigation and looked at the data set they used for building their models and stuff. And while doing so, we noticed one interesting thing. So they considered a commit message to have the why information if it contained a link to the issue that reported this issue. Just the presence of the issue, nothing more. And when we looked into it, we saw that that actually doesn't really make sense. So if you look at this on the left side, this is a commit message which says, remove usage of framework member as a raw type. Then we went and looked at the issue that is referenced from this commit message, which is here on the right side. And if you read through it, you'll see it's exactly the same. No additional information is provided. So this led us to start wondering like, so, okay, so just the inclusion of the message uh, of the link does not really provide you why information. What you need to do really is really read the content or consider the content to decide whether you have the why information or not. So with this observation, we went ahead and tried to answer these two research questions. One is, does the commit message have any impact with software defect proneness? And how does the commit message evolve over time? And does it remain steady? Does it get worse? What happens? Right. So, now what I'll do is I will try to give you a in-depth view of what I did by going through the steps of the empirical analysis. Also to give you an idea about how we do work by bringing in qualitative and quantitative approach and also bring in machine learning to answer the questions that we are interested in. So bear with me. So we started by conducting semi-structured interviews. And we did that with 13 developers from open source who had at least three years of experience. And we asked them questions like, what is the impact of not including what and why? How does it impact the software bug proneness? And also we asked them about their own commit message writing style in terms of what and why, and what do they believe? Do they think that their, what is their perception? Does, do they think that their writing improves over time? Once we did that, the next step was to actually have a broader view, right? Not only 13 people. So we conducted a survey where we reached out to 2,600 developers from Apache. And we selected Apache specifically because Apache has a strict guideline of how to write the commit messages. And that makes them a good candidate for this analysis. So we got 93 response, which is about 3.5% uh, not so exciting, but that's what we get, right? They're they are giving us it for free. So, you know, how much can you get? <laughs> so once we had that, then our goal, which was our eventual goal, was that we wanted to check how it impacts the software quality in terms of defects. And to do that, we needed to analyze a large number of comments. Large means hundreds and thousands. So we obviously cannot do it manually. Me and GY sitting there, it would take years. So what we had to do is we had to build a machine learning model and we went the usual route where we started by labeling data or creating supervised training data. For doing that, we relied on the data set that was provided by the state of art work that I was mentioning earlier by Tiana Tell. So we took their data set and we knew that their data set is not properly labeled in terms of why at least, right? So we looked into that. So we labeled it independently and uh, we had a high inter-rater agreement, Cohen's kappa of 0.95. And the thing that we were looking for or we labeled for was, does it have the what information? Does it have the why information? And if it had both what and why, we labeled it as a good commit message. Once we had that, we had to build, we had to try out different classifiers. Here is the table where we tried a bunch of classifiers. And 
we find out that ensemble, which is the ensemble of ILSTM and XG post, actually outperformed all the other classifiers. So we decided to use the ensemble for, for the rest of the analysis. And we evaluated it using the typically used metric like precision, recall, and F1. So once we have our classifier finalized, then we can actually try to answer the question that we are interested in, which is the commit message's impact on quality. Even before we could actually answer that question, there was one more thing that we had to solve, which is uh, essentially we needed to figure out the commit message quality preceding a bug introducing commit. And to do that, we relied on an approach called SZZ. So the basic idea is you first identify a commit that fixes a bug and then backtrack to identify that commit that actually introduced that bug. Once you have identified that bug introducing commit, then you can do your analysis of looking at preceding comments. And using this SZZ approach, we analyzed or identified 15,000 comments that introduced bugs. Once we have this, we essentially looked at the comments that preceded that bug introducing comment. And we went back up to 1,000 comments to see, to measure their quality. And we used that machine learning classifier that we built in the pre showed in the previous slide for measuring the quality. Now, using this approach, we analyzed 91,000 comments. And of course, we wanted to measure it numerically. So what we did is we proposed this quality score, which is essentially the ratio of window size, which is the number of comments over the comments with positive levels within that window. So this is the metric that we use for quantifying it. Now let's look at the results. So this table is essentially showing the effect size of difference between comments that introduce the bug and comment that did not introduce bug. And it's showing the uh, effect size for both what and why. And if you look at the first row, which I have highlighted, you can see that there is a significant difference, statistically significant difference in terms of effect size between the comments with good quality and bad quality that introduce a bug and that did not introduce a bug. Now this number, you might say, okay, this is not such a big number. This is 0 0.10, but it's statistically significant. So this is not the only contributor towards introducing a bug, but it's one of many. And the other interesting thing to observe here is that this observation actually holds for as far as 100 comments. So up to 100 comments in the past can have impact on the bugs that we are introducing uh, in terms of their comment message quality. So that was one of the uh, observations. Now answering the second research question, which was comment message quality evaluation or uh, evolution, how it evolves over time. So this is uh, the evolution. And what we did is we calculated weekly quality score, uh, comments made in a week over comments with positive levels. And the interesting observation here is, as you can see, right, in terms of what, why, and good, it's always degrading. So what it is telling us is that the, as the project grows older, the comment message quality degrades, which essentially uh, matches with what we have seen in the past in terms of projects overall quality. Now, one very interesting thing to observe here, uh, not from this slide, but if we tie back to the survey and interview results, more than half of our participants actually had mentioned that they believe that their comment message quality uh, improves over time. And as you can see here, definitely that's not the case. So, and this is interesting, but not surprising because we have seen this many times in other areas of software engineering where the perception is different from reality. In many other uh, subfields of software engineering, we have seen that. So to summarize, comment message quality matters. Comment message quality degrades as the project gets older. And of course, developers have an incorrect perception. Now, this is what we saw from that work. Now, as part of our ongoing work, what we are looking at is Apart from what and why, what additional information should we bring in? Right? What, so should we be considering the observer of the comet? Because there are different stakeholders that looks at a comet. So should we be considering that? And also, are we just going to take some kind of summary for let's say from ChatGPT and just dump it in there? No, 
you have to somehow formulate it, structure it in an effective way so that it does not become cumbersome for the reader. So that's what exactly we are looking at right now as part of our ongoing work. Now, moving on to the second topic, which is about machine learning. So if you noticed, I used machine learning in my work, and it's not only me. Most of the software engineering researchers rely on some form of machine learning for their work. And so much so that there is even a field called AI for SE. So that led me to start thinking like, okay, what is the quality of these machine learning models that we are so much reliant on? Let's, let's, let's have a look at their impact. And the paper that I will be talking about, it was published in ESEM 21 with my students, Jirigasi and GY. So the work that I'll be talking about is an empirical examination of impact of bias on just-in-time defect prediction. So before we go into the details of just-in-time defect prediction, let's see what is just-in-time defect prediction. So let's assume that you have a comment that introduces a bug, and then you have another comment that fixes that bug. And you can have a bunch of pairs like this, right? Then wouldn't it be nice that given these data, we've trained some kind of machine learning model that takes a new comment when it arrives and classifies whether this comment is risky enough to introduce a bug or not. And so that the developer can actually allocate resources accordingly. And that's exactly what just in time defect prediction model does. It takes a comment and then predicts. Now the input to just-in-time defect prediction model is a comment which contains a comment message, the thing that we have been talking in the, as part of the first work that I was showing. And then it also contains code changes, codes that have been added and removed. And you can have uh, occurrences of this all over the comment, right? Bunch of pairs. Now, these defect prediction models, just-in-time defect prediction model takes this comment separating the commit message and code change, and then creates an encoding. Using that encoding from the natural text, it creates a feature uh, vector, does the same for code change as well, and then combines these vectors, and then you put it to some kind of multi-layer perceptron to decide or to classify whether it's going to be a defect introducing or not. And this work, in this work, we actually focused on the code change feature extraction or code change feature. Why? The reason we focused on it was we wanted to answer, does each comment have an equal difficulty level to be learned by the prediction model? And you might be wondering, okay, out of millions of questions, why are you wondering about this question? The reason was we actually, as part of our preliminary study, we were looking at the data sets that are used in defect prediction model, in the state of our defect prediction model. And the graph that you can see here at the bottom represents one of the most frequently used uh, data set in defect prediction research. And one interesting thing here to notice is that majority of the data has only small number of files modified as part of their change, commit change. And we are calling that majority class. And you will see a small portion of comments that has large number of files modified in these data sets, which we are calling few short class. And as you can see from this long tail distribution, that the comment characteristics are highly skewed towards the majority class. And few short class comments are underrepresented because it's only a few during the model training. So what it essentially means is we are systematically missing out on predicting on these difficult bugs. Difficult in the sense that they involve more files to fix. So we are missing out on those in terms of prediction. So with this observation, we wanted to answer these two research questions. One is, is there a difference in terms of prediction between the majority class and few shot class? And the second one is, can we actually utilize the information from RQ1 to improve the performance of the classifiers in terms of defect predictions? So <laughs> first thing that we had to do was we had to identify characteristics, comet characteristics. So we 
relied on existing research for doing so. We found the comic characteristics that were identified to be important by previous researchers, which contained file count, file, uh, number of edits, multi-line comment count, and inward and outward dependency. So this was identified by Motwani at L in MSR 2018. And in this work, we only focus on these features, but you know, you can focus on so many other features. We have to select some. These are the ones that we selected. And again, in this part, I will not really go into the details of the empirical analysis, just like I did in the first uh, paper for the sake of time. But from a very high level, what we did is we split the data into training and testing. And then we trained DeepJIT and CC2 BIC. These are two model names. They are the state of art uh, defect prediction models. We took them, we trained them on this data set and then evaluated it on the testing data. So we ended up with correct and incorrect predictions. And then we compared the commit characteristics between these correct and incorrect prediction groups to see if there is any difference to answer our RQ1 and to make sure that the difference we are seeing is statistically significant, we conducted manually tests. So here is the result. So let's focus on the first row for, for this one. So as you can see, file count for the correct classification group is significantly smaller than the wrong classification group, right? And this actually is true for most of the commit characteristics. So what does this tell us? This says, or at least to us, it says that we are consistently doing good on the correct classification group, which is smaller in size, involves less files, involves less edits, but we are doing wrong classification whenever we have to deal with larger number of files being modified or larger number of edits. So this essentially tells us, answers our RQ1, which is defect predictions performance is significantly impacted by these characteristics. And the other interesting thing here is that majority classes are easier to predict, but we are doing consistently bad on the wrong, uh, minority or few, few short class because they are bigger. And also we have less of them to train on, right? Just simply less data. Now, based on this observation, we had to take the next step, which is can we somehow utilize this information to improve the performance on few short class? So we set out to do so by building this approach called Sifter JIT. So what it does is we take all comments and we split the features based on uh, their performance using the approach that I just showed into majority class and few short class. Then for the majority class, we build a state of art defect prediction model. We take any one of the state of the art. The reason we can take actually anyone, including deep GIT for the majority class is because the performance for majority class already is very high. The F1 score is 0.9 for them. So there is not a lot of room for improvement there. It's almost near perfect. Now we focused on the few short class and for doing so, we relied on Siamese network. And as the name suggests, uh, the Siamese networks are connected on both ends at the beginning of the end and also shares weight. And I will not go into the details of the architecture uh, for the sake of time, but we picked Siamese network because it has been shown to be effective in few short learning scenarios. So that's why we selected. So essentially we end up with two classifiers, one for the majority class and one for the few short class. Now, if we look at the result for research question one, as you can see, the Sifter JIT, which is our approach, statistically significantly outperforms the state of art in every category in terms of AUC precision recall. And <laughs> so it, it essentially helps to improve. And also we had to compare it with the baseline, which is oversampling, right? You just simply oversample data from the categories and see how it performs. And as you can see, the second column, compared to the second column, Sifter GIT still outperformed the oversampling. Now, one very interesting thing to notice here is that the performance of Sifter GIT, though it's better than the existing technique, it's nowhere near perfect, right? It's 
about 70. And we know from previous research that if a model's performance is not at least 80% or so, which is more human-like, developers don't really use those tools. They just simply don't like it. So there is a lot of room for improvement uh, compared to the majority class, right? You still have a lot of room for improvement. And that's exactly what we are doing right now. So from based on this work, what we learned is that we can identify the characteristics that are impacting the performance. So what are the approaches that we can do? One thing is, we can take the typical approach and try to investigate additional models, right? Let's find some other model that improves it. Uh, that has been done to death by others. So now what we are looking at is, can we somehow exploit that information even further? Because we know we can identify the characteristics that impacts the performance. So can we somehow synthetically generate more data focusing on those characteristics? And as we already showed in the previous slide, simply randomly oversampling does not work. So it has to be guided using some mechanism. And that's exactly what we have been working on. And we have a paper related to this published in ICSI, which will be presented in May. Uh, but we are there is a lot of room for improvement there as well. And I will not talk about that paper, but if anyone is interested, I, I'll be happy to talk offline about that paper. Moving on about the third part of this talk, which is accessibility and inclusion. So as I was mentioning, being part of this department, it made me see the challenges the users face when a software is not accessible. And me, along with collaboration with Professor Sam Malek and Professor Stacy Brentham, we started looking into accessibility. And what we essentially, what I, excited us was that accessibility is important, right? And we know that 15% of the world's population has some kind of accessibility issue. So we have to cater to them. And users with some form of disabilities, they have to rely on assistive services for interacting with the software, with the apps. And these uh, assistive services can take different forms, maybe screen reader that verbalizes the content, and it could be special keyboards that allows them to interact with the app instead of just touching on the phone screen. So here is an example, or here's a figure showing switch access. Now the question that we were facing at that time is what are the testing strategies that has accessibility in mind and what are the things that exist? So with that triggers, we looked at, and we saw that there are primarily two approaches, manual, where there is a use case, a real world use case, and someone, ideally someone with accessibility issues, utilizing the assistive service, interacts with the app, and then creates a report of the accessibility issues. Now this approach obviously is high fidelity, very positive because it's use case driven and it simulates the real world user behavior using the assistive service. The problem with this approach is it's costly. Right? It's time consuming and it is impractical because you have to do it after every update. And also it is may, may not even be possible to find users with all sorts of accessibility issues. So uh, making it not so feasible or expensive. On the other hand, the automated approach that exists is you take a screenshot and you run it through some kind of Google accessibility scanner. For example, Google accessibility scanner and it highlights and identifies the accessibility issues on that screenshot, right? So a report something like this. Now, the good thing about this is definitely this is fast and you can do it after every update. The problem with this is developers don't really utilize this information because as part of another previous work that we did, me and Sam, we found that 50% of the templates that are provided by the popular IDs, for example, Android Studio, they already come, come with accessibility issues. So developers simply ignore them. And then another work uh, by other researchers showed that half of the accessibility, actual accessibility issues are not even identifiable by this kind of static scanners. So this led us to start thinking, we need an approach that takes best of both worlds. 
an approach that is high fidelity, use case driven, simulates as tip service or utilizes those. It's fast and it can be done after every update. And that's where Latte was born. So it essentially does what I just said. It takes the existing test cases and executes them automatically using the assistive service, simulating an actual user's behavior. So Latte has three steps, and I, I will not go into too much details about them, but uh, from a very high level. It starts by taking the existing test cases uh, and converts it into use case specification format. And then taking that format, it executes those use cases. So let's spend next few minutes talking about this step two, because this is where the exciting thing is happening. So here you can see a screenshot of the Android app of uh, Walmart. And let's say our goal, our test case is to click on the enable location button. That's our target. That's what we want to achieve. <clears throat> so from the test case using step one, we could identify the element that we are interested in, which is enable location. And the action that we want to perform is click. So enable location, this is what our target is. So what we can do, we can essentially interact with the app using the assistive service. So once we do that, I don't know if you can see the green box on the top highlighting the arrow. So that's what it will first focus on is navigate up. And that's not, a, uh, that's not the element that we are actually trying to test. So let's interact with the app again using the uh, assistive service. Now the focus shifts to, as you can see here, we interacted. And now the focus has shifted to share your location. And that is still not the element that we want to trigger. That's the, still not our target. So let's interact with the app again using Ascript service. Now we have reached what we were trying to reach, enable location button. So then we can execute the action that we are interested in, which is click. So we click. So allow Walmart pop-up appears. This is what we wanted to trigger. And this is in essence is the main idea behind use case executor of uh, Latte. Right, and then you iteratively keep on doing it for all the test uh, actions that you need to perform. Now using this approach, what essentially happens is you get an accessibility report, which contains accessibility warnings and accessibility errors. So the difference between warning and error is warning is something that does not really stop you from achieving your target, but it adds delay. It create, makes you take more time. So this is that's why that's a warning, but an error is something that will completely stop you from achieving your target. Latte also produces number of actions or provides number of actions and also a video recording so that the developer can actually understand the pain the user has to go through when interacting with the app using an assistive service. Then we manually analyzed all these results. And when we were looking at the results, what we saw, we actually ran this on 20 apps and we found that using TalkBack, we identified 39 failures in 19 apps. And using switch access, we identified 11 failures. And uh, you might call it scary thing is that 11 out of 11 failures identified through switch access were not identifiable using the existing state of art scanner. And 21 out of the 39 failures that were identified using talkback were not identifiable using scanner. And we, then we did some manual analysis to categorize them. And I will not go into the details of them for the sake of time, uh, but let's talk about one accessibility error very quickly, which is non-standard implementation. And as the name suggests, it happens when the developer does not stick to the standard implementation and they implement things by themselves. So those are not compatible with the street service. So let's say here we have an example of the Yelp page of a coffee shop. And our target is to essentially provide it a star rating, right? We want to achieve this using Ascript service. So if you use an Ascript service, which is being shown using the green box square, the focus keeps shifting as it's supposed to. 
but it simply just skips that because it's not compatible with the strip service. So what this means is if you were essentially trying to give the star rating using a strip service, you cannot, even someone with vision cannot, and let alone someone who is, you know, like vision impaired. So this is an example. And again, I will not go through each and every one of them for the sake of time, uh, something to think about. So last but not least, let me thank my collaborators, industry partners, funding agencies. Without their help and support, the things that I showed here would not have been possible. And one interesting aspect of my work is it's highly collaborative. It takes me to all over the world. Here is a map showing my current collaboration network. The blue part uh, where my collaborations are, which I'm still far away from covering the whole map. The hope is by the time I am done, by the time I retire, I want to turn this blue, but let's see how far I can go. So in conclusion, software is a critical part of our life. Its quality is very important to ensure. That's what I have been working on during my graduate studies and as part of my journey here. And over time, it has uh, converged. It has become broader. Now we have new challenges coming our way, right? Chat GPT, new Nobel domains like quantum computation. All these are throwing new challenges towards us. And let's see how my work becomes even broader to handle these challenges in the future. And that will be something that I'll be talking to you in some future work. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you. Time for questions. Oh, very nice talk, Mr. Uh, so in the beginning, so in the first project that you were uh, talking about, about the commit messages, mm -hmm. what are the features that you use in the glass fire? Right? So you turn the glass fire on some features mm -hmm. that you extract from the message. So, so we text, so we would embed the words. So we use the words, the text for the commit message classification because it's natural text, right? So we did not specially look for any additional features because that was not part of the that current work, but yes, you can bring in additional information regarding, for example, you can bring in the expertise of the developer on that code base, right? Uh, have they written a bunch of comment messages in this area or in this portion of the code? So you can look into all those additional factors, which we did not look into, at least in this code. For the text itself, so do you just measure the number of times that a, a token appeared or like what, what how you transform the text? what goes inside So we utilize the usual steps, right? Like you remove the stop words and then count the TFID and all of those, okay, yeah. the typical NLP steps. So no specific feature extraction from the comic message. So we didn't do that. Many models have uh, uh, some, like some limitations on the input size. Mm -hmm. So, and many commits are actually very few, even if they involve very few files. So how do you deal with that? That's a very interesting question, important question. So what we did is we removed all the refactoring comments from our analysis, because refactoring comments is the ones that are huge, involves a large amount of files and stuff. And the thing is, the reason why we removed it, first of all, to make it you know, tractable. And the second reason is, in refactoring commit messages, you cannot really go into the depth of why you are making this change, right? Because then it would be a gigantic comment message itself. So that's why we uh, like filtered those comment messages out. And for doing that, we use the tool ref minor, which automatically identifies with some uh, performance deviation, uh, the comments that are supposedly refactored. Random question. Uh, Sorry, can you, can you... Uh, so can the actual definition of spark spark can represent spark mm -hmm. so you like spark getting your requirement or it's like a front end error mm -hmm. what do you by spark so in our analysis bug is something that is producing the incorrect result when you have a test case failure okay. so we at least for the comment message quality analysis part we did not look into let's say requirement related bugs that came from an 
misunderstanding of the requirement. We just focused on bugs that, you know, like test cases failing. So functional bugs essentially. In the first paper that you presented, you showed a graph of how the quality of commit messages increases over time. Mm -hmm. So has there been an analysis of how that uh, quality of code uh, messages is affected for each developer? And also as a software uh, project goes bigger, newcomers also get added to that project. Mm -hmm. So what has been, has there been analysis for on, the, on that aspect? So I haven't done, and as far as I know, nobody has looked at like individual developers because we are not trying to put anyone on the, the fire, right? <laughs> so, but one thing that I have looked at is, uh, does the core contributors compared to the newcomers, do they write more smelly code over time? That is something that I have looked at. And interestingly, there is actually no significant difference between the core and non-core contributors in terms of introducing additional smells. So, and it kind of makes sense, right? Because if you are a core contributor, you are writing 80% of the code. That's the definition that we use for defining core contributors. People, 20% of people who makes 80% of the contribution. So they are writing a lot of code and they are not actively trying to stop smells from creeping in. So they are injecting a lot of smelly code. On the other hand, the newcomers, they are writing a small amount of code, but they are also inexperienced and also don't know, don't look for smells. So they are also introducing smells. So in other words, both of these groups, in terms of their code smell introducing tendency, they are adding equally, statistically equally from both sides. Now, if you say, and of course, when you try to measure the quality of code, you have to pick some metric. I picked smell. And I haven't done any analysis looking at do newcomers introduce more bugs or not. I haven't done that analysis. So that could be something interesting to see. But the problem is, not a problem, the thing that we need to be aware of is that we don't really want to do per person analysis because it's it could be used in the wrong way, right? You can use it for finger pointing, like, okay, this person is doing bad code. And we don't want to create those kind of mechanisms. At least I don't want. So I've been staying away from identifying individual characteristics that leads to problematic code. Anyone else? You know, I got asked a question. <laughs> First, thanks for talking. Second, you know, with my history of configuration management, sort of the, the first part of the talk about the commit messages, the, the question that comes to mind is why, right? So there's a bunch of less good commit messages. Mm -hmm. Then a bug gets introduced. Why is that the case? Is it because the developers are going back and reading all those commit messages and can't make sense of it? Is it because the commit messages are actually reflective of the quality of the code? Um, what, what is it that's the phenomena that's actually playing out there? So we did not go back to the developers and ask them like, okay, this is our observation. Tell us why do you think this happens? We didn't do that. But I can kind of answer the first part of your question, or at least the first reason that you think is developers go back in the history, look in different comments, and then try to make sense. And because the commit messages are bad, they really cannot infer and they don't have the context. So because of that, when they try to com contribute their own code, it becomes problematic. It breaks things. It introduces bugs. And the reason why we can I can say that is when we were doing the initial survey and interview, we asked them, like, what do you think is the effect of having a bad what and why, bad comment message? And their response in general was, we look at those to make it sense. And if the message is bad, obviously I will not be able to make good sense of it. And there is a high turnover rate. So I don't really have that person to go and ask like, hey, why did you make this change? So that kind of answers the first part regarding Conclusively saying anything like, okay, is it because of this or that? We really have to do another study where we take this result, go back and show the developers like, hey, this is what we saw. Can you try to tell us why this is happening? So I guess, I don't know if that answers your question. It does, except if the developers are already having the wrong perception, mm -hmm. they also might have the wrong perceptions of how they work. Right. So it would actually be really interesting to know 
how often they really go back to these mm -hmm. messages. Because my sense of it is not all that often, right? And mm -hmm. that and if they don't do that that often, that doesn't explain the large effect size you see. Mm -hmm. So there must be some other thing at work. I think it would be interesting to try to sort that out. I have a working theory that might ask that. I don't know if it's true or not, right, but sure. could it be the case that developers that write good commits with a what and why, uh -huh. they're just better developers <laughs> than that? <laughs> <They're more careful. laughs> is, is the commit message reflective of the quality of the code? Right. But well, they're the precision or they're, yes. they're exactly. So I, I cannot comment on that, but what I can comment on is <laughs> no, not speculate. We actually did that analysis, okay. is we looked at the difference in terms of quote, commit message quality between core and non-core contributors, because the idea was core contributors are more experienced, so they should be writing, you know, better things, but not really. So, but again, core contributor does not mean they are better programmers. So that is something that we need to be aware of. And I don't really know how to measure if someone is a better programmer or better coder because what is the metric that you're going to use? Is it lines of code that I've written? I could be writing crappy millions of lines of code. So, and I could be doing a lot of work, but that does not really make me a good programmer. So again, I don't really have an answer to that question, but core and non-core does not have an uh, association with the commit message quality. All of them are equally writing bad code, bad commit message. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I have a question about um, was the data used and tend to commit from projects that had a sole um, collaborator or a sole committer, or were there also projects that involved multi contributors? And could, could maybe a potential hypothesis be that if you're working on a group project, maybe your commits get through based on that collective understanding? Mm -hmm. How to make better? So what we did is we took projects from Apache Foundation, and these are all uh, projects with hundreds of contributors, and that has been around for years, multiple years. And in, in our analysis, we don't have any, let's say, group project or small in, in uh, single contributor projects. We systematically filter them out because if there is only one developer, there is no communication going on, right? We remove that. So the result that we are seeing is the pattern of like how people communicate in large settings and especially in projects where it's enforced that you actually have to write a good quality comment message. So what this essentially at least to me tells me that even though there is a procedure in place, the developers are, don't really, are not really sure about what they are looking for in those messages. So that's why according to our standards, some of the not so good messages are going getting in. Not some, a lot of them are getting in. But again, right, who am I to say developers don't know what they're doing? So <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. Yes. Um, is there a way to know if the developers are even looking at the commits? What if they're kind of just like skipping steps and rejecting code that they're fixing a problem that they see but not looking at commits? So Part of it is answered by the survey that we did where we asked them, like, do you look? And they say, yes, but we did not ask them how frequently, the part that Andre was talking about, like how frequently they look at and to what extent, right? Like even looking at means you can just skim through it or you can spend time. So we did not really ask that question. So to answer your question and Andre's question, we actually have to do the study where we take this result, go back and show that this is what our empirical analysis is showing. Now, can you tell us like why this might be happening and also add those questions like what is the extent how frequently you come back to see and to what extent you look at right what is the rigorousness of your analyzing previous comments so i don't have an answer for that but yeah it would be done as part of a future work um one of the questions that i have I found it really fascinating about how in the beginning you talked about bugs as a socio-technical mm -hmm. sort of uh, like phenomena that is happening. Um, and I was thinking, do you, do you think that there's an 
there's something about that for the accessibility part as well, because you know it's a it's a process that's coming in from like a design conversations way over there, mm -hmm. um, and and it sort of percolates into like, the product, the product itself. Um, and I was just kind of I guess just curious about it whether you envision or imagine sort of uh, like a tooling or a support system that sort of goes back to the the process itself of course so that has been a very active research area and i so you can actually see that it's accessibility and inclusion so one aspect that i looked into we actually have a paper on ICSI, i think 2020 i don't remember exactly which year uh, but what we looked at is the inclusion aspect so are female developers facing some additional difficulty because of the thought process right and again it may not be the politically right way of saying it but what we saw is many of the existing tools that we use for development uh, doesn't really match the mental model that female developers have so there is this interesting thing and again i'm saying it from very high level very uh, roughly is that there is a difference in thought process like DFS, depth first versus BFS kind of programs, problem solving style. And many of the tools that we have, even including GitHub, does not really cater to the BFS style of problem solving. So, and we, what we saw is that, yes, this leads to issues from female developers with respect to contributing code. They have to cross more hurdles. Now, the interesting thing about this is once you get trained, this hurdle essentially becomes a distant past memory and you cannot really find it anywhere. So we looked at, does female developers contribute more buggy code? They don't, right? Do this contribute more smelly code? They don't. And the thing is, the reason why we cannot find that because there are a bunch of uh, technical issues because you cannot do the gender prediction from a name itself. You can but it is noisy. And so essentially it becomes quite complicated. So going back to the question that you asked, yes, there are bits and pieces that are being developed that can help in the whole process so that the final product is, you know, like inclusive. Uh, and that again, is just one angle of inclusivity. Now, if you look at the software product and if you consider the bug, as a byproduct of the socio-technical activity. That's what I have been focusing on, but you can look at all the other things as well, right? So for example, again, it, it, you may call it a part of the process. So a developer who is who has some kind of accessibility issue, a blind developer, what are the challenges that person is facing, right? Can we provide tooling to help that? That exactly what is something that we are looking at right now. So in other words, to answer your question, Yes, there are so many products and things that can be built along the whole development pipeline that can help to mitigate these issues. It could be accessibility, it could be inclusion, it could be bugs, it could be anything that you name it. And yeah, that I could not finish in five years. So I would need more time. <laughs> All right. So it is now slightly past three. The team is to make our way toward questions, but not before we thank Dr. Hart. Um, and once more recognize, um, you know, how truly fortunate we are is here because um, somebody with that kind of passion and that, that depth of research. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs>